Welcome to the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. This is a podcast about understanding other people and understanding ourselves. You can learn more about it at behavior-podcast.com. On today's episode, recorded November 11th, 2021, I interview Saul Albert about conversation analysis. That's the scientific analysis of talking and conversation. We also talk about ethnomethodology which is the broader realm of study under which conversation analysis can be seen to fall. Ethnomethodology is the study of how social order is produced in and through processes of social interaction. If you're interested in language and communication and the complex set of rules that govern these areas, I think you'll enjoy this one. Personally, I find conversation analysis especially interesting because of the work I've done analyzing the verbal behavior of poker players. I spent eight months full-time researching and writing my book, Verbal Poker Tells. That work involved me logging hundreds of hands of poker from televised poker programs and from hands I played, transcribing the exact statements and conversations, looking for verbal patterns that were highly correlated with specific poker hand strengths. My work wasn't at a scientific level. I didn't publish a scientific paper or anything like that, but it was definitely the most intellectually rigorous work I've done and also the most practically useful work I've done when it comes to my poker tells work. Verbal behavior is just much more easy to reliably interpret compared to physical behavior. And that concept I think applies to non-poker real world situations too. A lot of people have an interest in interpreting non-verbal physical behavior. For example, trying to analyze footage of people giving speeches, people giving interviews, interrogation footage. But really, if you're interested in these things, your time would just be much better invested in learning more about verbal behavior patterns. There's just so much hidden meaning in how people communicate. While I find that the nonverbal physical behaviors are simply just so often ambiguous, and there's just a lot less meaning in the physical stuff in general. A little more about my guest, Saul Albert, which I've taken from his website, saulalbert.net. His research explores the technology of social interaction at two ends of the spectrum of formalization. At one end, his work on conversational AI asks which features and mechanisms of human social action can be represented and modeled computationally. At the other end, he studies how people make aesthetic judgments and interact while dealing with underdetermined cultural objects and situations. This program spans multiple, often incompatible disciplines, so his work builds methodological interfaces between them. You can follow Saul on Twitter at Saul, that's S-A-U-L. Okay, here's the interview with Saul Albert. Hi, Saul. Thanks for coming on. Hey, Zach. It's great to be here. Zach okay or Zachary? Zach's great, yeah. Okay. So let's start with maybe you can explain what conversation analysis is. Sure. Conversation analysis is the study of talk in interaction. So how people interact, move around in the world, how they structure and organize talk. So it treats talk like a social institution and studies it like any other institution by breaking it down into its component parts, seeing how it's organized and studying all the different components of it. So it ranges across anthropology, linguistics, psychology, begins with sociology though. So hence the study of social organization. I've seen it described as a kind of a slow motion analysis of talk and treating each word and pause and element of conversation as a major event. Do you think that's a decent analogy for what's happening? Yes, I think so. Turning those seen but unnoticed features of everyday interaction into big subjects of sociological study, it's uh, slow motion is one part of it because it comes about first in the 1960s when People began using reel-to-reel tape recorders to capture talk on the telephone and then subject it to empirical analysis. And until these technologies were widespread and easy to access for sociologists at UCLA or UC Irvine, where where it started, people hadn't really thought about talk as a worthy subject of study. It was often ignored. Language was for linguists and it was grammatically or uh, syntactically correct or not, uh, or it was languages were studied comparatively. 
and the idea of studying it in that microscopic detail of talk of the production of talk how people sound when they speak it seemed outlandish i think to people at the time well certainly to sociologists at the time it was yeah kind of um, Mybridge moment, if you know uh, Edward Mybridge, who first began using photography to break down the component structure of animal and human movement. I mean, that was in the late 19th century, but there you suddenly had a scientific study of the way that people moved very much more um, detailed and realistic than you would have otherwise seen uh, in representations in paintings or other kinds of means of representing things. So mm -hmm. slowing down speech, that was a relatively new innovation for researchers. And yeah, I think that's a very good description. Was it also a shift, a, a revolutionary way to think about language in terms of just the fact that people kind of took for granted at all of these rules that were hidden and under the surface? Was that part of the the thing that was so surprising and interesting about it was was that there were all these rules that people kind of know about but hadn't really fully been explained or examined before yes interestingly though it was the things that were on the surface that were of interest so whereas psychologists psychotherapists had long speculated about the idea that there was unintentional mm. or unacknowledged or unconscious features of people's thinking while interacting the revolutionary aspect of conversation analysis i think was that it focused on the things that were visible audible mm -hmm. just on the surface of talk and from those and the organization of those once you broke them down and slowed them down and repeated them you could suddenly see what harvey sachs one of the inventors of conversation analysis called order at all points so however tiny and minute the details seemed and however insignificant the actions what Sachs and his colleagues were able to show this is all really really closely organized stuff and people pay an immense amounts of attention and clearly because of the way that they behave when they're interacting to each other they focus on those details so yeah they matter they're important even if they are these kind of minute particles of talk mm -hmm. I was reading um, Elizabeth Stokoe's book, Talk, The Science of Conversation, which you had recommended to me. And I, it, it took me surprisingly long to really get the point of what conversation analysis can be used for. A small note here, to be clear, what I meant here wasn't a statement about me finding the book hard to understand, but more just my surprise that I hadn't figured out the clear practical benefits of this kind of work a little sooner by analyzing uh, real talk, real examples of talk and studying it in depth and what's really happening, you can find better ways to communicate. And, uh, you know, and, and one of her points was, you know, people are pushed around by language more than we know by the words and phrases that we use. You know, we're, we're mm -hmm. much more, at, you know, influenced by language than we tend to think. And uh, can you think of things off the top of your head that stand out as interesting examples that you would bring up for people that haven't really delved into this area? Sure. There are some findings, some empirical findings and some applied empirical findings that I think are very striking because I think they take the form of the findings that we're maybe more used to seeing in psychological studies, particularly so-called nudge psychology. I think this is a trend in social psychology to look for ways of manipulating people's behavior, basically, or managing behavior. But I think there's a step to take back from that in, in Elizabeth Stokoe's book, and I definitely recommend everybody read that if they want to understand what conversation analysis is. A step back from that applied kind of uh, finding that's almost a uh, counterintuitive discovery is just the activity of doing conversation analysis, which is collecting everyday examples of talk, mundane everyday activities that people are engaged in and subjecting them to detailed analysis, because it's that structure that is everywhere. It's not so much a finding as a realization when you start seeing it that, wow, talk is actually organized very delicately into these sequences of action and response of question and answer of greeting and greeting and that when people deviate from those patterns suddenly we can see all of the ways in which they scramble to re-establish 
this detailed, tight organization of of their social reality as they experience it through interactions with others. Mm -hmm. So that's the first, I think, that's what drives the discoveries that Elizabeth Stokoe talks about in her book. The discoveries that are then applied to looking at, say, how doctors and patients interact with one another are very powerful because of that first step of really understanding what is the structure of a doctor-patient interaction. So one of the most striking findings, I think, comes from uh, a paper by John Heritage and Jeff Robinson and colleagues who've worked on similar or related findings in medical interaction is that where you have, say, a doctor and a patient in a primary care consultation, it can be very difficult for the patient to introduce more than one concern. And I think perhaps everybody who's been to a doctor has had this experience. If you've got one or two things or three things that you want to talk to the doctor about, if you bring up the first thing at the beginning of the consultation, by the time you get to the end of the consultation, it's really difficult to bring up anything else because you kind of been through a cycle of saying hello what's the problem here I've got an achy knee and maybe you haven't mentioned that you've also got a dodgy elbow or a painful eye or sinus infection or something so they studied this situation to understand what's the the kind of train that people get on when they enter the doctor's surgery what are the well Elizabeth Stoker talks about the racetrack that there's this kind of identifiable pathway that you move through so they studied how many problems did patients arrive with, how many did they actually manage to talk to the doctor about, and they looked at ways of modifying that racetrack, changing the pattern of interactions to create secondary opportunities to introduce a new problem. So that boiled down to the sum versus any study. So at the end of that interaction, what Heritage and, and Robinson and others were able to show was that doctors would often do, was there anything else you wanted to talk to me about? So they, on the face of it, created an opportunity. What they found was that any is a rather negatively polarized word. If you think about where do you use any, uh, do you have any more X? Would you like any more? That these any's tend to come in places where there's an almost an expectation of a negative response. Whereas some offers the opportunity for more things to be added. So they asked a, a controlled group of doctors to say any and another group to say some. And they did a large scale randomized trial and found that actually changing that one word from some to any, was there something else you wanted to talk to me about, had some huge effect on the number of secondary concerns that were raised. So. It was a really beautiful finding because it came from this detailed understanding of the whole structure of the interaction. And then the one point at which you could create a like diversion or another pathway back into an earlier phase of the interaction where another concern could be raised. So I think that's a kind of iconic mm -hmm. study in applied conversation analysis for those reasons. Yeah, that was really fascinating to me. Just And then the amount of the effect was so large, it was something like, 70% or something. It was really astonishing. Yeah, the difference just from that that one word. Yeah. A small note here. This finding has a lot of other practical applications. For example, in a workplace situation, avoiding the is there anything else phrasing might make it so that people are more likely to tell you about work-related issues. I just wanted to emphasize that these findings can have some big practical value. Another one that stood out in um, Stokoe's book was the uh, the power of the words talk and speak, oh, yeah. uh, talk versus speak when she was talking about suicide uh, prevention mm -hmm. interactions and how weak the word talk is. Like, I don't want to talk anymore. Somebody might say talk is, you know, meaningless. The word talk sounds kind of meaningless versus the word speak. Like, I want to speak to you sounds more meaningful, sounds like action, and that having a, a better uh, effect, you know. So these kinds of examples were just really interesting in that book and really drive home the power of language in, in a way that I think most people are just not aware of how much power language has. Yeah, I mean, that example is a really good one. So hostage negotiations or these kind of high stakes negotiations that Elizabeth Stokoe has been studying, those are a really lovely example of a situation in which there are real experts, you know, these negotiators, they are aware of the power of language because they are absolute 
masters of the of the craft of talking people down of dealing with these situations it's just that they wouldn't necessarily be able to tell you if you ask them if you ask mm -hmm. them to introspect about how do you actually do it at that level of detail it's something that maybe they could explain in very general terms but wouldn't necessarily be able to put their finger on precisely the words that they're using or the right particular patterns that they're using right and that's yeah and that's one reason i I wanted to do this podcast in the first place was these kind of hidden, um, you know, people have these skills that they may not even know about, you know, or, or they do know about them and most people don't know about them. And so the, yeah, digging into these granular kind of obscure strategies is, is, is really interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, so what is, uh, how does conversation analysis relate to ethno methodology? Okay. That's a, Big question. Uh, I'll do my best to answer it in a way that is somewhat um, contained. So ethnomethodology is the mother discipline of conversation analysis. CA, I guess if I'm allowed to abbreviate it at this point, comes out of ethnomethodology and uh, is one of a number of, not exactly sub-disciplines, but applications of ethnomethodology to a particular material for analysis. So conversation analysis applies ethnomethodology to talk and social interaction. Ethnomethodology is uh, the study of how social groups do their groupness. What are the methods that they use to constitute and perform and recognize their groupness, the ethno um, that makes up that collective of, of people or of practices. I know that sounds a little bit abstract, but uh, a good example might be the study of games, uh, how people organize the rules and structures of any number of social situations that have recognizable uh, rule structures and how do they make sense of the social world. That's a very broad, <laughs> I think you can't really define ethnomethodology in anything but the very broadest terms mm -hmm. because it is a very, it's a movement within what that comes from sociology that really tries to redefine what sociology is, tries to kind of turn it on its head and say, look, we're not studying social facts. We're not studying people and social organizations. We're studying the methods through which they produce the social facts and they recognize the social organizations that they're members of. So it's a bit of a sideways take at sociology. Conversation analysis, I think, looks much more recognizable as a social science than this much broader attempt to redefine what sociology is and, and think about social organization in this very abstract way because it deals with one particular material and that material has particular kinds of properties like it's sequentially organized. You can record it and it has this temporal structure where you can look at it in the same way that microbiologists look at things through a microscope, conversation analysts look, th look at things through recording technologies. Am I understanding correctly that part of the, the difference about ethno methodology was studying what people actually do in their, in real practices versus, you know, more of an academic setting kind of situation or am I off base on that? No, that's, that's absolutely right. I think the, well, let me, let me maybe do a bit more of a history because I think it's useful just to say something about where ethnomethodology comes from in explaining what it is. So Harold Garfinkel was developing ethnomethodology at a time when sociology especially macro sociology that was involved in the study of large scale social movements and looking at economic data and large scale surveys was becoming very high level, very abstracted from the mundane and the everyday. Mm. And he was interested in getting rid of the theoretical preconceptions that people would have to take into those studies and looking instead at the ways in which people made sense of the social world. And those end up being rather mundane in lots of situations. So he would write about how do people practice ordinary kinds of activities and how do they recognize when a social situation is 
changed or when a social situation is uh, is something that they can access and address and deal with in various different ways. So I guess a very famous example that is quite instructive as to what ethnomethodology is comes from Garfinkel's breaching experiments. This was a early tutorial problem that he he used the, the expression tutorial problem because he would use these to explain to his students the concepts of ethnomethodology. He'd get them to breach social norms. Mm. So one example would be to play a game of tic-tac-toe, but then perform some egregious move that obviously isn't part of the rule set, but without remarking on it at all in order to see how would the other player react or he would instruct his students to go out and bargain for fixed price goods in a shopping mall and see how did this play out in terms of the social rules that were applied or recognizable within that situation um, or to treat everything that went on in the home in your own parental home for example as if one were a guest so thanking your uh, mother or father excessively for passing the salt and what this led to was the discovery that people make sense of these social situations not as transgressions of rules but as different social situations so bargaining for fixed price goods actually often ended up apparently in people actually getting things on the cheap but transgressing the tic-tac-toe game it wouldn't result in somebody explaining oh here are the social rules you've transgressed them or here are the games rules you've transgressed them it would be it would be understood in, as a different social context. Oh, you're being mm -hmm. aggressive or you're angry with me. So the point there is that these ground level strategies for making sense of the social world that Garfinkel was interested in exploring turned on its head the idea that sociology could even plausibly understand what was going on in the social world by studying economics or these macro social phenomena or theorizing about what people were doing because how would you understand how people made sense of these phenomena these rules these social structures if in the moment of being involved in social life people would have to rationalize what was going on around them rather than applying some theory or some abstract set of rules so conversation analysis applies that same curiosity about how are the rules of conversation organized and what happens when we break them or what happens when people do things that maybe upset the normative expectations mm -hmm. that might be applied to even the simplest things question and answer structures that is doing ethnomethodology with talk yeah one point i liked in uh, stoko's book is that how we view people how we view other people how we see them, how we see their personalities is largely due to the rules that they use and apply to conversation, right? Like sort of like you were saying, transgressing in the in these unwritten rules that we all carry around with us. When other people transgress those rules, we view them as, you know, assholes or whatever. We, right. we view them, we judge them based on their unwritten rules that they have. Uh, and do you think, is, is that one of the key aspects of, of conversation analysis is that, is that is that a major idea in that area that you know people are these these rules around uh, that we carry around conversation yeah i think the point that elizabeth stoker makes in talk and that conversation analysts operate with i think by default when you're looking at the microstructure of interaction is that well, you have to look at people as just the collection of interactional practices that they make available to other people, the things that they do, the over and visible and audible and perceptible things that they do with each other. So rules, I think, are less relevant than practices in that context mm. because we can't see the rules. The rules, if mm -hmm. they exist, maybe they're tacit and you could speculate about them. And my training is in cognitive science, which is very fascinated with rules or physiological underpinnings of 
behavior or psychological underpinnings of behavior. But if you just focus on what people actually do that you can see as an observing social scientist and which presumably their interlocutor can see, and you try and make sense of what they're doing based on how they're responding to one another. In some ways, it's a very limited view, but in other ways, it's a very, I think it's a radically different understanding of, of what an individual is. In fact, it's not really a view that thinks of individuals. It's a view that sees the social world as constructed through interaction by multiple parties organizing the activity of talk with one another. So it dissolves the idea of the individual sometimes in a way that I think is quite helpful. Sachs, uh, apparently, uh, one of the inventors of conversation analysis, well, the inventor of conversation analysis is quoted as, as saying that we shouldn't anthropomorphize humans in our analysis of them. And I think that that's what the focus on the surface level of talk gives us a much less anthropomorphic idea of humans, which is a bit, you know, it worries some people. I think it is a useful contribution to social science, that's for sure. Can, can this be seen as related to like a Skinner-esque behaviorist kind of view of analyzing what the actual behavior is versus trying to interpret what is going on? That's a, a very good point. And many people have criticized conversation analysis as a form of behaviorism. What I'd say is that Skinner, if Skinner is an, uh, an atheist about the internal lives of humans, then perhaps conversation analysis, at least methodologically, is pretty agnostic about it. Simply doesn't speculate about what's going on internally. There may be many things going on internally. And I think you'd find it hard to to dig up a conversation analyst who would subscribe to that kind of behaviorism. In fact, there are so many things that you discover if you look at what people actually do in talk, in interaction, that would make it impossible to imagine that they're simply behaviorist machines or just cybernetic feedback systems. It doesn't correspond with the evidence. So even though you can remain agnostic about whether there's something going on behind the curtain, I think just on the evidence of what happens when you look at people talking, you'd be hard pressed to believe that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and probably getting too off topic, but I kind of, I feel like the Skinner behaviorist stuff gets a bad rap because it's like, to me, it's a similar thing of st just studying what is actually happening. You know, to me, it doesn't, doesn't subtract the idea of there being a mind somewhere. It's just saying, this is all we can study. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And in that sense, there's a certain methodological, you know, the methodological uh, correspondence to some extent, but yeah, a very different set of commitments. So how does, uh, how does conversation analysis relate to your work? How have you used it in your, in your work? Sure. So I have more or less three areas of research that I focus on. One is conversational AI, and I'm particularly fascinated with the way that both we address and use and talk to conversational user interfaces like Alexa and Siri, and what our uses of them tell us about our understandings of these kinds of devices. But I'm also interested in using observations and empirical findings from conversation analysis to inform the design of speech and language technologies. A second area of focus is on how people do evaluations in interaction. So one of the ways that I got involved in conversation analysis was looking at how do people talk about art? How do people evaluate things where there's no clear metric for evaluation? And that whole area of work has included looking at how people evaluate the performances and improvisations of, uh, of artists or dancers or people doing all kinds of difficult to evaluate um, or subjectively evaluatable things. And then thirdly, my work looks at the ways that conversation analysis and other areas of the social sciences can be worked together. And particularly my training in cognitive science, which is often quite experimental, butts up against the observational priorities of CA, which tends to avoid 
experimental studies or reducing things or counting things and quantification. So some of my work is more methodological and looks at, well, how could we use CA in doing laboratory studies or doing statistical and quantitative analysis? And what are the theoretical and methodological issues concerned in that? A small edit here. I'm going to jump to a part of the conversation where Saul goes into more detail about his research studying dance. I've also studied how people interact in uh, dance and how people improvise in dance or in dance settings. And I think for, for me, that's really the payoff of conversation analysis is that when you see people doing things and partner dance is one of them that are almost unbelievably fluent, really skillful, and it becomes almost magical when you see people dancing together, especially very skilled improvisers dancing together, it can become, it's fascinating to imagine, well, how is this possible? And lots of people study dancers to understand sensory motor entrainment. There's lots of ways that you can study it as a sort of phenomenon of human coordinated action. Conversation analysis deals with precisely that level of coordination, but in talk. So you can apply it to looking at how people move their bodies, how they interact in all kinds of ways that we wouldn't necessarily acknowledge or see as uh, as conversational, but have those 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 initiation and response dynamics. Is there something that stands out as one of the more interesting um, findings that you've had in your work? Yeah, uh, where shall I start? Hang on, let me have a think about this. Um, <laughs> Big question, I guess. Yeah, I've got to choose one of my babies, uh, and which one should I choose? Which should I throw out? I guess. What first got me involved in conversation analysis was trying to understand how people do assessments and evaluations, especially in contexts where there's no clear metric for evaluation. So I started looking at how people evaluate bits of art. I was especially interested in how people stand in particularly contemporary, international contemporary commercial art galleries where you'll often get highly conceptual pieces of art. And they will talk about what they see and they'll interact about all kinds of rather difficult to describe things that might be happening around them or objects that might be presented for them to speculate about. And those conversations really intrigued me because they seemed so hard to nail down in terms of what it is it that people see in that environment? What do they register as relevant for aesthetic evaluation for scrutiny as an artwork and it turns out if you look at what people do and what they say they will tell you they do aesthetic evaluations they talk about their education and their knowledge of the other's education what what do we know of each other's knowledge and then how from that knowledge of each other can we talk around and about these objects in ways that may be quite well quite often they'll be taking the piss or they'll be, um, they'll ridicule it, but they'll do it in a way that displays an immense sensitivity to what the other knows. So that process of designing evaluations very specifically for another person and for a specific situation, that was what got me really excited about conversation analysis. And I think that what I've learned from, from looking at those situations, and I think also looking at how people how people do things like dance or other artistic activities is that what we often think of as up to the, you know, in the eye of the beholder, things that people will have to make their own decisions about. That's not how they work at all. People don't allow one another to make those kinds of evaluations without really holding them to account as to what it is that they see very precisely. And how does that judgment have a meaning for me and for mm. you in this specific situation. So yeah, those, those are the things that got me excited about it in the first place and still excite me. In my understanding that part of your work has been analyzing uh, conversation rules and, and behavior to educate AI software, is it, was I understanding that correctly? Yeah, so some of the work that I've been doing recently has been looking at what can we do with the tools that are currently being developed to deal with talk, to deal with large scale collected data from 
conversation, also from language models. What can we do with those that emulates some small part of what humans do when we're talking to one another? I think it is a very small part. And also, what do people do when they're interacting with these devices, like conversational user interfaces, virtual assistants? What do we do that shows our understanding and interpretation of those systems? How do we interact with them in ways that show how they're relevant for us in, in our lives? So I was curious, uh, and maybe you're not able to say, but are there people in the industry that are using, using your work for, um, for their software? There are definitely people using conversation analysis. I'd say there's a good conversation design handbook written by um, Bob Moore at IBM. He's a conversation analyst that people are using. Elizabeth Stokoe herself has written and is a part of conversation design communities. Kathy Pearl, who's the head of uh, conversation design outreach at Google, uh, has cited and used conversation analysis in in her guidelines for the creators of these virtual conversational user interfaces and virtual agents. So yeah, people are using this work, and I'm 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 part of that group of people doing CA in a way that hopes to inform conversational AI. It seems like AI to replicate realistic conversation is still pretty rudimentary. Would you say that's Correct. It seems like even text-based AI to have conversations still seems pretty basic these days. So I assume those things aren't too far along, but maybe you have a different take on that. No, I tend to agree with you that these are very, very rudimentary, that the kinds of things that these devices can do at the moment really simulates a very thin slice of what people do in interaction. So if you think about all of the different social roles that we inhabit when we do talking and hearing, and this goes back to uh, the kind of participation frameworks that were developed uh, by Irving Goffman that have been elaborated in conversation analysis, the idea that you've got not just speakers, but also when we talk about others and we animate their voices, you have animators and authors. So when people talk, they're not just talking from their own perspective they might report on somebody else's speech there's a tremendously complicated and layered set of things that happen when people tell a story or let alone asking a question or giving somebody an invitation similarly he hearers not just hearers they might be overhearers or eavesdroppers or bystanders and the voice interface like alexa can only do one thing it can listen for a wake word and then it can listen for a command and then it can react so yeah there's a lot of things that we're not even close to being able to do with these devices with conversational ai because they're fundamentally very very limited and often trained on you know the, the language models that are used to inform the ways that they speak and the things that they can interpret and transcribe are based on written texts not on language and social interaction as it's done. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things to me in thinking about language and, and conversation and, and consciousness is thinking about how the, the action of speaking, the necessities of uh, having conversation can impact who we are, can kind of mold us and shape who we are. For example, the fact that having conversation requires us to take turns as something that shapes us in a way in, in the sense that we have to keep in mind the other person's, uh, a model of the other person and a model of ourself. And I'm curious, are those kinds of ideas part of conversation analysis or is that kind of outside, you know, that that's maybe another, another school of thought uh, studying how we're shaped by the necessities of language? Not at all. That's very much part of conversation analysis. So as is often the case with different disciplines in the social sciences or in, I suppose, any scientific research, there's a different set of terminology that we use to talk about the same thing. So what I think might sometimes be called common ground in cognitive science when we're thinking about keeping a model of the other in mind and having some kind of reflexive understanding of how do we appear to the other person. Sometimes, again, that's referred to as a theory of mind. Those 
questions about consciousness, the theories that we have for describing those questions about consciousness. In conversation analysis, they're all a lot simpler because we're just dealing with the surface level. So there's a much more humble set of terms uh, that conversation analysts use, such as recipient design. So recipient design is the principle or the, the way in which somebody involved in an interaction will design their talk specifically for the other, knowing what they know about the other, taking into account what from their perspective is available to that other person. So I gave the example a little while ago of people sitting and talking about art in a gallery. Well, if I know that you're the world renowned expert on Van Gogh, and we, we're at an exhibition uh, and we're looking at Starry Night, I'm going to design my observations, my assessments of that really differently to you than I would to somebody else without this, you know, kind of expertise. So that's one slightly cheesy example of recipient design, but it's everywhere. It is mm -hmm. just in every part of everything that we do and say for one another, we have to take into account what we know of the other. So whereas cognitive approaches would think of this as us assembling models of the other and coming up with some kind of theory of mind where we're strategizing about the other, mm -hmm. maybe that's happening. But if we look at what they do or what people do, then what we see is them designing their talk in a way that takes into account what by doing it, they're showing they expect or know of the other. So it's just about the same concept, but from a very different um, observational principle, I guess. Mm -hmm. And do you see that as, or are there theories that language itself, the need for us to communicate with language was a key driver in evolving intelligence? Because it would seem that, like you said, it's, we need to have these theories of mind, the, a model of the other person, keeping in mind what they're thinking. Are there theories around our communication driving our intelligence further? There are lots of theories about how language has driven the cognitive development and the social development of humans. And I think that those theories definitely have a place in organizing our understanding of the whole human subject. Conversation analysis can't really speculate about those things, I think. It could mm -hmm. certainly be used to look at particular points in say the development of children's speech of things like turn taking how those kinds of practices imply certain kinds of cognitive or physiological development but it's not a field that does a lot of evolutionary mm -hmm. speculation and theory partly because it just deals with what people do in the recordings that we can make of them doing them today and to go beyond that, to theorize about how this might be explained in a completely different order of observation, where you're looking at genetics or you're looking at anthropological and archaeological uh, records. It, it's not really the business of conversation analysts, so mm. I don't think any of them do it. But you could certainly use what CA has discovered to drive theorizing about human development and and evolutionary history but it's not something that i think many people do one thing i find interesting is how quickly people talk right like in the in that conversation analysis book by stoko you know one of the key points of conversation analysis is just how quickly we talk and how much we overlap silences and how it seems like we don't like silences because silences can be interpreted as tension or conflict or dislike or whatever. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the role of analyzing silence in conversation analysis? Absolutely. Silence in conversation is a really fascinating topic. And I would definitely encourage people, if you're interested and you're finding the idea of studying conversation in this way intriguing, look at the work of Elliot Hoey, one of my colleagues who's spent a lot of time looking at silences, particularly lapses, which I think are the kind of uncomfortable silences you're talking about, where we're involved in turn by turn talk and it's somewhat fluid and quick. And we have established this pattern of one action following the next. 
And then suddenly things die down and perhaps there's some difficulty reestablishing turn by turn talk. That's maybe the less frequently observed type of silences because the silences that we experience in conversation are absolutely everywhere. So silences within one speaker's turn. So when I'm talking and then I'm going to at some point stop talking or I'll just take a breath, we'd call that a pause. If you take the next turn, which you might do at any point, uh, whether or not I nominate you to take the next turn, the silence in between my ending, my turn ending and your turn beginning, that's a gap. So we have a technical set of terms for referring to within speaker silence and then between speaker silences and then lapses where we're no longer doing turn by turn talk. And that comes about because of conversation analysis and it's sort of fundamental um, or I guess initial observation about turn taking and what are the rules of turn taking? How does turn taking work? Because it's only because we have a normative structure, an expected structure of turn taking that we could tell that you were being silent when you should have said something or that I'm pausing when it's my turn to speak next. So silences only become owned or recognizably silences that belong to one person or another through having that understanding of the turn taking system. So that's kind of very fundamental to, to conversation analysis is being able to have a, a, a technical description of silence that tells us why do we feel uncomfortable during some silences and then some are perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. uh, they are ubiquitous and it's important to be able to describe them accurately. Yeah, that was the some of the most interesting stuff in the in uh, Stokoe's book about how meaningful even tiny silences can be, and we all have a an right. awareness of that, like an instinctual awareness. Like when you ask somebody something and they pause for even like a, a fraction of a second, there can be many of us would find meaning in those situations. Like someone doesn't want to say something immediately; they they might be hiding something or or have a negative response that they're suppressing, things like that. Yeah, I mean, if I could, if I could say a little bit about that idea, you know, the idea that silences are uncomfortable or that people are hiding something, I think more often silences are really very innocuous. They're mm. just everywhere. And the observation that conversation analysts have made, and I think definitely Elizabeth Stokoe does give very, very compelling evidence of this in any of her talks that you could find if you looked up on, if you look her up on YouTube, you find her giving talks where she shows precisely those uncomfortable situations because they're very illustrative. But the, the flip side to that is the actions that precede those silences. So silences are intelligible as being uncomfortable or being awkward because what's happened right before them is an invitation, for example. So if I'm inviting you to, out to dinner mm. and I think, or I'm, I'm asking you for a favor, that silence is going to be very meaningful. I'm gonna pay a lot of attention to that silence because there's an expectation of an acceptance or a rejection. Even if the acceptance still comes, but it comes a bit late, mm -hmm that's a particular kind of acceptance. If you've invited somebody to dinner and then there's that 0.2 beats of silence. So yeah, I think that the silences are really, we recognize them in those, in those moments, but it's, it, it also tells us something about how do people interpret the responses to particular actions. And that's, I guess, one of the reasons that people talk about social action as being, again, very central to, to this way of understanding the social world. Is it possible to imagine a culture or maybe a, a culture exists where people talk slower? Because I feel like, at least in, you know, in the world I'm in, it feels like the expectation is to talk pretty fast. And I kind of, I, I kind of appreciate people who talk slower and have longer gaps between their <laughs> uh, responses. I, I, I'd almost like to be more like that, but I kind of feel pressured to talk more quickly. Do you, do you know much about if there are, you know, settings or, or cultures or places where people do have what we would consider abnormally long pauses in general? There are caricatures like that. So the caricature of family conversation in uh, Jewish households or Italian households is that you have, you know, these kind of ratio linguistic stereotypes or 
or kind of cultural stereotypes. Similarly, Danish is often caricatured as having this inordinately long pauses and gaps that mm. you know somebody will say something and then five minutes later if you, you watch scandinavian crime dramas they're very popular in the uk those will often sort of embody those caricatures mm. as it turns out if you actually look at how people respond to similar actions again it's about what kind of action is it that precedes the silence if you control for that and there's a very uh, famous study from 2009 led by tanya stivers um, at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics when she was there. She's now at UCLA. But she ran a study looking across 10 language groups, very different language groups, um, at how people respond to yes, no questions. So they controlled for the type of action. This was a yes, no question. It was on telephone conversations. They collected many examples in 10 different languages and then looked at, well, what is the response time? what is the the standard response time across these languages they found that it varies very little there's about mm. 200 millisecond silence is approximately the norm and you don't see a great deal of deviation if you plot them um, you know if you do a histogram of of where do the data points fall you'll find they're all pretty normally distributed and that suggests that there's just not as much variation as the cultural stereotypes would lead us to believe mm -hmm. And you use the, uh, I know in conversation analysis, the uh, notation system is very important. Are there different types of notation systems or is that pretty aligned on, uh, most people use a single kind of notation system? Oh, I love talking about this. Um, and I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of transcription in conversation analysis. It's really a, a kind of beautiful part of the research practice. So the first type of notation that people began using uh, back in the 60s and 70s was developed by Gail Jefferson, who was at first um, an, an intern and a student of Harvey Sachs at UCLA. She was also a dancer. And I think it was partly because of her familiarity with the difficulty of notating dance. If you can think of a time before video, people used all kinds of hokey systems, kind of 19th century systems for notating dance and bodily movement, like Laban notation, which is a, a kind of very structured, very limited way of describing arm and leg movements. Anyway, she was given a heap of recordings by Harvey Sachs and he asked her to transcribe them. She came back with this really carefully arranged semi-diagrammatic format by semi-diagrammatic i mean it looks like a film script so you've got one line and then the next line you know person a speaks then person b speaks then person a speaks again but she arranges them on the page so for example where people are overlapping you'll start that overlap with two square brackets and then you could indent both lines so that they appear on the page to be starting at the same time this is very difficult to describe in words but i think if you can get the idea that it it provides you with this kind of graphical overview of what that conversation looks like, but it's still familiar enough for people to read it. And that's how, when you're doing conversation analysis, you point to a line number and you make your observation and then you can tie it to something that is visible to everybody who's paying attention in the, the data session. Uh, I should talk to you about data sessions as well. This is how we sit down and do that kind of analysis. You will make an observation you have to tie it to a particular moment in talk that can be quite hard to do if you're just rewinding and fast forwarding and playing a recording you need to be able to have this sort of technical precision in your observation so that's what those transcriptions are used for they use the keys of a normal keyboard so they'll use for example square brackets to denote overlap punctuation doesn't denote the abstract notion of like a question, a question mark would be upward intonation and a period would be downward intonation. So it uses the conventions that we're used to from film scripts, from comic books. So all caps is loud or shouty. Underline is also emphasis. It uses relatively familiar conventions to create this really precise tool for making detailed observations about conversation. Uh, so that's Jeffersonian transcription. That's one format. More recently, 
there has been a tendency to use a, a separate system that's been developed for describing simultaneous activities like body movements. The beautiful thing about Jeffersonian transcript is it's working for turn-taking structures. So it's really designed to show you turn-by-turn -turn talk. But when you want to show simultaneous actions, it doesn't work quite so well. You also want to be able to see the onset of a movement and the sustain of a gesture and then the offset as that gesture declines and 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 falls or or, or halts so lorenzo mondada who's a, a professor of social interaction at basel university in switzerland she has developed uh, an alternative transcription format that tries to do for simultaneous actions what jeffersonian transcription does for talk um, and it's becoming quite widespread. It's not clear whether it's going to be as central to this particular way of analyzing social interaction. But there are also many other, many other methods. Lots of people mm. invent their own, but mm -hmm. it's a bit like uh, anything else. People who are who manage to create the system that everybody uses, uh, those those decisions they make a huge difference as mm -hmm. to what people study and what people can study. Um, but many also fall by the wayside. I'd imagine you get so good at reading those methods of transcription. Can can you just glance at those and get an idea of what it sounds like in your head? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. that's cool. yeah, absolutely. Certainly with Jeffersonian transcript, yeah, you you start to read it and you hear it as you read it. It's like musical notation. Yeah, and uh, you you also get faster at doing it. It feels a bit intimidating when you first set out, mm -hmm. but. Um, I think this is when I was reading your book, I was thinking, yeah, you could have really used this. It would have given you a very, in some ways it would have been a shortcut because your descriptions of the things that people do in those, you know, in the, in the, the verbal tells would have been, you could have written shorter descriptions, mm -hmm. but then you would have been spending an inordinate amount of time doing the transcription. So yeah, my book, Verbal Poker Tells, it was interesting because when I started talking to you just recently, I didn't somehow I'd completely missed this conversation analysis uh, world because, which is a little weird because when I started doing the verbal poker tells research, which involved me, you know, transcribing lots of, uh, you know, I spent hundreds of hours transcribing, writing down televised poker hands and, and hands I'd played and, and uh, formatting that and, and putting uh, different tags for different patterns into that. And so I, and I was actually looking for, something that would allow me to transcribe things and capture things like speed right. of talking and pauses and things like that. So I, I was really surprised. I didn't, I didn't somehow never noticed that it was probably just bad research on my part because I, I, I had gotten like Skinner's book on verbal behavior and mm -hmm. somehow missed conversation analysis. So I was a little disappointed in that because yeah, like you were saying, it would have been, I think too much overkill for a lot of what I was doing because I wasn't I was trying to do a broader thing and not do a scientific thing, but I think it would have been really useful to at least do a few of the things like overlapping or speed right. of response, uh, upward shift in, in, in uh, end of statement, those kind of things would have been really cool and would have been not too much more effort. Yeah. Right. I mean, but the, the nice thing about doing transcription or the, for me, the satisfying thing about doing transcription is it disciplines your observations because mm -hmm. you're forced to commit to a particular hearing. So, when you're doing that transcription, you're really attuning yourself to noticing the differences of very microscopic differences, for example, in the mm -hmm. lengths of a silence or intonational contour. So you get much more sensitive, your instruments become sensitized, but then also you can disagree with people about hearings. And then you've committed to your disagreements because you've not just written down like a vague schematic of what somebody said. You actually have really described it in a much more granular level of detail so that when you're then sitting around and doing the analysis together, and uh, as I've mentioned in, in data sessions, which I could talk to you about, uh, in the data session, you can challenge one another on that hearing. Mm -hmm. And that is a really productive moment because you can be wrong. And if you can be wrong, you can get less wrong. And I think that's quite powerful. Uh, that's one of the things that I find really helpful about Jeffersonian transcription. And there are lots of other forms of transcription. I mean, we could use, say, IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, and you know, really precise sort of 
technical descriptions of the sounds that people make with their mouths and, and voices. And that maybe is a step too far because it becomes legible only to a very small group of specialists. So it's a bit of a balance between legibility, lay legibility mm -hmm. and technical precision. In my experience working on the verbal poker tells book, kind of like you were saying, p starting to pay more attention to these minute things teaches you to see the world in a in a new way. Like I, I, I honestly learned so much from much more than I thought I would learn from writing research and writing that mm. verbal poker tells book. Like I, I started out thinking like I kind of knew what I was getting into and I, I kind of knew the area that I would write about, but I actually ended up learning a lot more and kept finding interesting patterns, you know, sort of like, uh, yeah, the, the same kinds of things, conversation analysis is, is studying. I kept finding these, these patterns that were recurring and kept meaning the same things, you know, associated with the same situations or, mm -hmm. or you know, same hand strength to be specific in poker, the same situations kept coming up. So it was actually like of all the things I've worked on, it was by far the thing I'm most proud of because I, it was relatively, well, I, it was almost entirely unstudied by anyone else. And that's what was interesting to me too. It was almost like getting into, right. getting into new areas. Yeah. And, and I think this is something I, I emailed you about. It seems that nobody's actually done a conversation analytic study of poker and poker playing. And I think it would be a very welcome study because it's, uh, it's one of those situations where people are suppressing the things that you would want to find out about, you know, they're trying to be ambiguous about uh, what may or may not be in their hand or to, mm -hmm. or to suppress the leakage of information. So and revert, yeah, they're, they're straight up trying to reverse things in some situations or even yeah. like re reverse them, double reverse them in some situations. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty, pretty confusing landscape of, of communication, I think, which might explain why it's, <laughs> pretty hard to study <laughs> it's designed yeah. it's designed to be analysis proof mm -hmm. i mean that's the problem um, but i think that you know what you were doing in fact by you know looking at these recordings repeatedly and building collections of them and seeing the similarities that is essentially what conversation mm -hmm. analysts do it's about creating collections much in the way that botanists or uh, you know would collect or zoologists collect specimens and then look at the minute differences between them and put them in taxonomies but we're dealing with the natural phenomena of everyday interaction mm -hmm. um in in very similar in very similar ways yeah if i could do that project over again and if i had more time on it i would have created a a, a database i mean i had my own database but it wasn't something i could i felt willing to make public because it was pretty rough mm. and but i think if i had more time and had could do it over again i would do it more scientifically and be like, I can show you wh why, how this is showing up. And, you know, this thing means this thing in like 80% of the cases or whatever, you know, uh, mm -hmm. if anyone listening ever wants to study, get involved in, in something like that, I'd, I'd love to collaborate and give at the very least give you, uh, my, my, uh, ideas for, for things to dig into. Yeah. Um, another interesting thing about the difficulties of language and conversation that I'm interested in is the the relation to uh, mental illness in the sense that mm. I think people don't understand how difficult it is to keep up, uh, to, to run all the programs that we need to run to be a social creature. And I think that's an unexamined area in mental illness. I think some people have talked about the, the role that social hardships play in, uh, you know, our state of mind, like, uh, Richard Bentall wrote Madness Explained, and he talks about the the social nature of uh, hmm. mental illness. And other people have talked about it too. But it, what interests interests me, you know, because I've had my own experiences with that. I, I dropped out of college due to a you know basically a nervous breakdown, high anxiety situation. Mm -hmm. And what strikes me about the difficulties of keeping up the social front, uh, there's just so many things that need to be operating well to have a conversation that we don't really examine in our day-to-day -day lives mm. like the the need to the need to keep up that theory of mind of the other person and to keep up our own you know our own uh, model of ourselves and mm. our, our ideas at the same time it's just it's such a heavy mental load that i don't think most people realize in their day-to-day -day lives but it's easy to see how anxiety and depression can weaken those those programs that we have to mm. run and once you and once you go down that 
kind of uh, hill of, you know, you start going down that hill of like, oh, these things that are required to be a social creature are now harder for me. And that kind of has a snowball effect where mm. you start, you stop seeing yourself as a social creature because you're not able to keep up the, mm -hmm. the necessary programs to run those things. And so it has an escalating effect. And I think that's, that's very interesting to me because I think it, it's related to just how difficult it is to have conversations and to be a, a social creature. Mm. I think that's a fascinating area of study. And interestingly, I haven't seen a huge amount of work on specifically depression and anxiety or other mental illnesses, schizophrenia. There are some really interesting studies. Uh, Professor Rose McCabe has done. Um, she's mm. been working on doctor patient interactions uh, and has done some really fascinating work on how mental illness is constructed in the diagnostic process and also on what the patterns of interaction are between doctors and, and patients in mm -hmm. uh, in psychiatric consultations and i've seen some of those conversations and witnessed some of the ways in which doctors are trained to speak to people with mental health problems and then looking at the results of how do they in fact uh, how does that training influence their practice? Mm. It's mm -hmm. quite difficult to watch. I, th I found those sessions where I was involved in, in those kind of analytic data sessions quite difficult to watch because people are stigmatized by particular ways of talking. You know, people are included or excluded given certain mm -hmm. rights and obligations or have those rights and obligations withdrawn from them through through interaction. And maybe you could point to a particular diagnosis, a particular pathology. But I have to say some of those uh, doctor patient interactions, some of those interviews I saw made me a little uncomfortable about diagnostic process and made me wonder about the degree mm. to which mm -hmm. these, these conditions are maybe reinforced and possibly perpetuated in certain ways. Now that's a very kind of anti-psychiatry uh, perspective and that that I you know I wouldn't attribute that to any empirical uh, work that I've done or any specialist knowledge <laughs> that I have other than also personal experience of family experience of, of mental ill health and seeing that I, I completely agree with you that the, that the ways in which people are included or excluded from society that that in in a sense is is really fundamental to uh, ethnomethodology to the question of how do people achieve membership of a social group or or have that membership withdrawn or revoked or not operative and i think mental ill health especially because it is so stigmatized is often mm -hmm. one of the conditions that is socially policed yeah if anyone likes these topics i'd recommend a, a previous interview i did with uh, nathan filer who wrote a book about uh schizophrenia and, and mental illness and, and some of those uh, those kinds of ideas about uh, just that our conceptions of them can be mistaken and, and they can be due to quite understandable you know stresses of dealing with the stresses of, of life because there are there are these stresses of life that are very major that I think you know for people that are functioning well just don't really understand them because they haven't encountered them but they're they're very understandable stresses but yes I, I recommend that uh, I did a couple episodes about anxiety and, and, and mental issues in the, in the past for anyone who's interested. But yeah, to your point about um, watching, uh, I, I've gone out of my way to, to read and, and listen to um, schizophrenic um, patients interacting with doctors. And, and you know, one, one thing that comes up in that realm is, is sometimes the interpretation that the, the person is, uh, is distanced from reality. But a different analysis would be that the they're actually being kind of, you know, they're finding the doctor's approach very uh, aggressive and, and they're responding to the, the disliking the doctor's approach. So they're responding in a way that seems nonsensical, but in a different light could actually be seen as just being like, you know, fuck you, basically those, those kinds of things. You know? <laughs> well, I have an, an example just from this one uh, session I did looking at some doctor patient interactions or psychiatric consultations, which was a woman talking to a doctor and explaining to her that she had 
this experience of uh, hearing the television telling her what to do and it was telling her to buy things. And the doctor was insisting that this was hallucinatory. And in some level, on mm -hmm. some level it was, this woman was really obviously struggling in the way that she was describing her experience to ground it or to couch it in a way that was intelligible as watching an advert. And I could understand that she was talking about watching an advert, but the way that she was describing it sounded, well, pathologizable. She was talking about mm -hmm. being told what to do by the TV when- Hearing voices. Exactly yeah. what the TV does. I mean, <laughs> watching the TV is right. gonna tell you to do things. But you know, I should, I should stress really, look, I don't know, I have no expertise in this area absolutely no qualifications in in psychiatry and mental health this is you know not something that i'm talking about as a researcher but just as somebody who who you know has some personal experience of of mental Ill health and and recognizes that that people are stigmatized in ways that are difficult to um take into account and that the diagnostic tools that we have for type of, you know for for determining what particular mental health problems people have they're done through talk they're through interviews mm -hmm. largely with psychiatrists and the kind of you know the diagnostic and statistical manual uh, the dsm that we use to give people a, a diagnosis again these kinds of interviews i think it's widely accepted i think even the author of the original dsm you know accepts that these are subject to all kinds of demand you know all kinds of influences that come from the interaction so i think it's a it's a i'm very curious about it but yes i don't know anything about it as a researcher yeah i should say too yeah clearly i'm not an expert either but i think it's to be clear it's you can definitely see other like examining the uh environmental factors or um you know stressors in, in people's lives doesn't take away from the idea that there could be uh you know genetic disposition, no. predispositions I mean, to things like that. Viable, so I just yeah. want to throw that out there. Yeah. Sorry. I'm very nervous about just spitballing about those kinds of topics. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. You, you can't yeah. be too careful to uh, yeah. make the caveats that we, that you need to make. Yeah. A note here. I wanted to emphasize a bit more what I was saying here as it may not have been clear. I think for most well-functioning people, what defines us as quote, sane is an underlying conception of ourselves as social creatures a fairly unexamined belief deep down that striving towards a shared reality with other humans is something worthwhile or something possible. And so what I'm trying to say here is that communication with the minds of others is much harder than most of us know, requiring much more of a mental load than most of us know. And for people who don't feel well, when we start having that degeneration of our social abilities, then it gets harder for us to communicate and keep other people's minds in our mind when we interact and things like that. Those are sorts of initial assaults on what it is that makes us, quote, sane. Those can be the initial ways that we start to drift from consensus shared reality and start to see ourselves as no longer inhabiting the socially defined world most of us take for granted. I actually haven't read that much about these ideas, so if you happen to know any work on things like that, please let me know if you would. I'd appreciate it. Back to the interview. If people want to keep in touch with um, the work you're doing, what's the what's the best way? Follow me on Twitter. I'm at Saul on Twitter. And you can also have a look at uh, the EMCA Wiki, which is the collaborative, collaborative bibliography of the field that I co-maintain with a group of scholars. Mm. So that's a great way of keeping up with what's going on in CA. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, I saw that. I didn't know that you were uh, involved in, in, in running that. Yeah. How do you get that uh, Saul uh, handle on Twitter? Was that hard? Did you did you have to pay for that, or did you just have that a long time? No, I was a geek. I would I, my former life. I was a geek, and uh, for my sins, was a very early Twitter adopter. I was going to say that's a that's that's one of the the, the early handles. I'm sure. Um, okay, well, thanks. This has been great, Saul. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Zach. Great to speak to you. That was Saul Albert. His website is at saulalbert.net. His Twitter handle is S-A-U-L. I'll also mention that Saul has done other interesting work that he didn't mention here. His blog on his website is a very interesting read. One thing he worked on, along with some other researchers, was an analysis of how Donald Trump greeted people at a White House event. They analyzed the minutiae of statements and body language and the likely functional reasons for why 
he behaved how he did. This has been the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. You can learn more about this podcast at behavior-podcast.com. If you like this podcast, the most appreciated way you can say thanks is to leave me a rating or review on the podcast platform you listen on. iTunes is always a good place to leave a rating on as that's the most popular platform. Also, I make no money on this podcast and I spend a good amount of time on it. So if you want to encourage me to do more work on it or to show your appreciation, you can send me some financial support via my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Zach Elwood, Z-A-C-H-E-L-W-O-O-D. If you're a poker player or even just interested in the analysis of verbal poker tells, you can find my book, Verbal Poker Tells, on my site, readingpokertells.com or on Amazon. Any ideas for shows you might have or thoughts about the show, you can use my contact form at any one of my sites, or you can find me on Twitter at A Poker Player. Thanks for listening. Music by Small Skies. <laughs>